I sometimes I wake up and go, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> like, you know, and then, you know, I, I clear my mind and, you know, I'm lucky that, you know, I exercise quite a lot and, you know, that, that helps me a lot. Um, and, and I just go, look, you just got to keep going and keep pushing and, you know, we, we, we're in the mix with everyone else. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Few cuisines have had more influence on the way we eat than Italian. Italian immigrants came en masse with a coffee machine under one arm and a pasta maker under the other during the 50s. Spaghetti bolognese is not a dish you'll find in Italy per se, but many suggest it's our national dish. For many, the global pandemic has had its challenges in Australia, and for those with Italian heritage, it's been devastating to watch from afar with cases skyrocketing in their homeland, Italy. Giovanni Pillu is a co-owner of award-winning restaurant Pillu at Freshwater. Giovanni, you're originally from Sardinia, but you call Australia home now. What's it been like um, this last couple of months um, with friends and family um, back in Italy? Um, it's been it's been different. Yeah, it's been very different, uh, I guess. Um, I, I don't know, like, what other term can I use, to be honest? Because, um, you know, it's something that we, we weren't expecting and, and no one was. And, you know, if you would have told me six months ago that all this was going to happen, I would have said, what, are you crazy or something? What are you talking about, you know? Um, but, you know, here we are six months down the track and, um, you know, we're still up and running, which is good. Um, back home in Sardinia, you know, that one of the lucky things is, you know, that I'm from Sardinia, so all my relatives live there and, um, you know, being an island, I guess it's a little bit more protected. Um, although they've had, you know, some cases, um, because the beginning of, um, you know, all this, um, when this happened, like back in March, a lot of, um, people from the North of Italy escaped to Sardinia to the uh, holiday houses. <laughs> so uh, they brought the virus with them. Yeah, so it was um, um, a little bit challenging to start with. And then I think they got it under control quite quickly. And um, it's been it's been okay. It's been okay, yeah. And you, you have your parents there and also your sister is a doctor over there as well. It's been- yes. Um, my parents, yeah, my brother, yeah, um, are there. And my sister is a doctor, so... Um, she was, you know, front line. I mean, she's a psychiatrist, but she had, you know, a lot to do, like her hands full, that's for sure. And um, the good thing was that she really helped out my parents, you know, when they had to um, stay home, locked up, um, you know. So, like, at the beginning, they couldn't even go out, like, you know, even to go shopping or that. It wasn't easy to go and do groceries and that, so she could do that for them because, you know, she was allowed to drive around with a permit. So that was good, and she kept she kept them, you know, um, under control, which was good. But you know, they live in a very small village. Like literally, Anthony, there is three hundred people in this village, and the closest neighbor is like you know, two hundred meters away, and then there is another one, another two hundred meters, and then the village is actually five hundred meters from where they are. So they couldn't have been any more isolated. Do you know what I mean? They didn't have to change much in you know the what's normally it is for them their day-to-day life so it wasn't it wasn't bad for them you know like um yeah the only thing was my brother couldn't go for a drive every day for the for the daily coffee and catch up with his mates because my brother's got cerebral palsy so my mother drives him to the next village for coffee and that every day so he was (laughs) he wasn't happy to be stuck at home um but look apart from that you know it's been okay yeah How does a young guy that loves surfing um, end up leaving Sardinia and creating one of the most famous restaurants in Australia? Oh, um, well, you know, this was, oh, man, in 92 I came here. So that's ages ago, bloody thing. Now time is flying away. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It it was pretty amazing when, you know, when, um, when I met Marilyn in Sardinia and, you know, she said to me, oh, you know, I come from Australia and I'll tell you background, but I come from Australia. It took me about half an hour to think and understand what Australia was, especially when, you know, she used to say to me, oh, you know, it takes over 20 hours flight to get to Australia. And I kept saying, and I kept 
just racking my brain. I'm going, it takes about nine hours from Sardinia to Rome in the ferry. And now it's a 20 hour flight. I couldn't get my head around it. It took me a while to get, to get, you know, because yeah, coming from an island and from a small village and I wasn't, you know, one of the best at school. I could, I didn't comprehend how far away Australia was, but you know, the time that I made the decision to, um, you know, to come here, I think it was the, the uh, luckiest day of my life, to be honest, um, because, you know, coming to Australia has been a real turnaround for me. I literally upside down my life went. Um, and, you know, never looked back since, and it's been amazing. So, yeah. And then lucky we landed, you know, I landed in um, the North Shore. Back then we used to live in Cherry Hills and then moved to Freshwater and then ended up, you know, working in freshwater now so you know it's been pretty amazing journey for me you're regarded as one of australia's best chefs how, how did how did it all start for you chefing <laughs> that's a big call anthony uh, that's a big call I, 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 look, personal uh, opinion mate thank you but yeah i mean there is a lot of my colleagues you know there's so many great chefs out there australia's amazing culinary uh, scene it's been you know it just grown so much. Um, look, you know, I started from scratch, you know, because as everyone does, and, and I fell in love, you know, with, with our industry, with cooking and, you know, with anything to do with hospitality. And, and when I came to Australia, I persevered and, you know, went to TAFE, did all the right things and took all the right steps. I needed to learn English. So going to an English um, school in Brookvale with, um, you know, 20 Italians in the class <laughs> didn't help me. <laughs> so, um, you know, and playing soccer with them. So I wasn't learning much English, but then I decided to join TAFE and um, that was really good actually. Uh, like one of the best things I've done is to go to TAFE because not only to learn, you know, more of the cooking skills and that, but also I think the English picked up quite quickly. I met great people. A tafe, um, including you know my head teacher Peter Bansley, that you know we're still really good mates. Um, you know from '94 that we've known each other, and you know he's been an amazing mentor for me, and he helped me out so much, especially in the beginning. And then um, you know uh, it, 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 it was been an incredible journey. So you know f for me then to become who I am now, which you know I still classify myself as a cook because you know I, it's, that's what I do for for living. Um, I love cooking. My role has changed a little bit over the years because, you know, we, um, we do employ a lot of staff and we've got now three venues on the run. And, you know, so my role is slightly changed, even if lately I've gone back more into the kitchen and, you know, I'm cooking a little bit more, which I absolutely love. Um, but yeah, look, you know, it, it is – sometimes I think back and I go, wow, you know, um, I have done a lot, you know, here and, and – but nothing comes from nothing. You know, I, I, I met, you know, great people along the way that helped me a lot. Um, you know, my old boss, Peter Vignasca, the first restaurant that I worked in in Terry Hills. Um, and obviously, you know, I couldn't do what I do or I couldn't have been what I, what I am now without the help of Marilyn, my wife, a business partner for uh, nearly 20 years. <laughs> so, um yeah, without her, probably I wouldn't be here talking to you right now, to be honest. Um, well, you have three um, amazing venues and Pillow is, you know, I can't even recall Pillow, Pillow not having two hats. It's ex an extraordinary restaurant on the water there. What, what was the impact on your venues when, you know, that first shutdown happened in March? Um, it was, uh, it happened really quickly eh, because I don't, you know, I don't know if you remember, but within a week, you know, things have changed so quickly, like really, really uh, fast, you know, we went from, you know, reduced numbers and then, you know, everything started coming really fast at us and we had to react really quickly. So within a week, probably that was one of the hardest things we've done in uh, all these years that we've been in business, to be honest, you know, the change that we had to do um, to stay open and, you know, we, we quickly, um, you know, had to come up with a, with a you know, tuck away menu new systems, um, you know, like all the stuff that we had to do, like within, you know, within a week just to stay afloat and stay open because the last thing we wanted to do, Anthony, was close because we know that closing a restaurant or reopening a restaurant, it's very challenging no matter what, you know, like you got to start from scratch and that's always a hard gig. 
We didn't want to, you know, obviously lose some of our key staff. And, you know, some of the guys that we had, um, we still have on under um, um, working holiday visas. Um, they couldn't get back overseas. Some of them went back quickly. A couple of French guys we had, they, re- they jumped on the plane and left straight away. But some of them stayed here, One, especially, you know, a couple of them, they're from Milan. So they didn't want to go back to uh, north of Italy because, you know, things there were really, really you know, going crazy. And um, so we had, we wanted to stay open, basically, to keep, you know, some of the staff. And then there was a massive job, you know, within a week. But, you know, we do have such an amazing team. And, you know, over the years, we built up an incredible core team that, you know, all together, we made it happen. And, and you know, after a, a week or two, we were literally up and running. And, and being where we are, to be where we are, it's been um, lucky for us in a way because, being a suburban restaurant rather than a city restaurant, which I felt really for them because a lot of city places had to shut because the city emptied. Mm-hmm. We were lucky because, you know, after 15 years, the community around where we are, Freshwater, you know, all the surrounding Y, Kirkel, Brookfield, all around Alambi, like they, they really supported us. Like, you know, they, 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 they wanted to come and, you know, and buy the tuck away and, we quickly became quite busy, actually. Um, and then, you know, things got better because obviously, you know, like I said, we got a great team and we got used to it. So, you know, but it was literally a, a reopening of a new venue. It was in, in, incredible. <laughs> so, um, you know, then we started having actually a little bit of fun as well because we were doing something so different. You know, it was more like, you know, simpler food than, you know, fine dining, but still, you know, tasty and, you know, we were still buying good produce and it was, it was, it was, it was great, you know, in, in a way then it became actually something that we, we you know, we, we, it was something different, you know, so, you know, when you do something different, you get excited and, you know, you, you want to do it well and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, um, you know, it worked well for us after the, the initial, um, you know, bit that it was quite challenging and then, you know, obviously, slowly we started reopening again, and and now it's it's okay. Yeah, it's okay. What were some of the most popular dishes during that takeaway time that you wouldn't have normally done in the restaurant? <laughs> well, I can tell you what it is because it really put a mark on me because I was the lasagna boy <laughs> and uh, <laughs> making so many lasagnas in all those trays, and um, I actually developed <laughs> a bit of a tendonitis in my elbow <laughs> because I was lifting all the. <laughs> I know it, it absolutely uh, put me under pressure. So lifting these trays in and out of the oven, like, you know, day in, day out, and it was so busy. Like we were selling, you know, 80, 90, 100 lasagnas a week. So, you know, I've, I've still got this, um, what they call tennis elbow that I'm curing now because as a result of that. <laughs> but it was so crazy. Like the lasagna, we could not keep up with it. We had to eventually put, um, you know, like we had to get people to book it in especially weekends because then we knew how many we needed to prepare because we just could not keep up. And then people, you know, were getting a bit disappointed when we ran out and, you know, but that was an incredible dish. Like it, I never thought that such a simple, you know, straightforward for me, like, you know, I grew up having lasagna as a family because, you know, coming from a biggish family, lasagna was, you know, in the middle of the table, easy to share and that it became crazy. So, yeah, that was definitely the most popular one. They might have to rename it Lasagna Elbow. <laughs> the Lasagna Elbow. <laughs> I know. They, they started, you know, making jokes and go, oh, you know, the Giovanni Lasagna or, you know, like it, uh, all this kind of stuff that, you know. And then it were not only that, but that, I mean, all the dishes that we did were, you know, obviously a little bit more up market because you know, I think people expected a little bit more than, you know, two heads. Although it was stuck away, so we did really good dishes, and we we did um, also the suckling pig. We kept it on, and you know what? I must say this: we couldn't have done the pig unless our supplier, our farmer, Matt from Melana Park, which you may, may may have heard of. They were really really good because we said, Matt, if you like, because we're not charging as much as you know, obviously. Um, when they you know, like on the menu, it was a takeaway item. So I said, Mike, if you can help out, we'll work all together here. We can use a lot more pigs, you know, and they dropped the price. And as a team, we, we you know, with our suppliers, we could offer 
premium product even for the chocolate away menu and that was really really cool because people really loved it because you know the suckling pig it's one of our uh, most popular dishes so that you know if to have that on our chocolate away was amazing but like i said we couldn't have done it unless you know matt and sue came on board and you know um the, the, they they dropped the price a little bit and then we could do that as well so all the, yeah i mean that was popular as well a little earlier, you mentioned how important the local support was during that period you were doing takeaway. What's it been like since reopening? And you still have some restrictions, but are you presenting something different to the market? And how, how has the support been? Um, look, in all honesty, the only the thing that we learned and, and we did was that, you know, we wanted to kind of, um, in a way, get back to do a little bit simpler food, you know, still like amazing quality, obviously, you know, so much Australian produce, as much as we can, you know, seasonal, all that kind of stuff, that has that never changed. But just simplifying a little bit the dishes that we did, you know, because I think, you know, fine dining sometimes, you know, things that, you know, you try to complicate your life too much, which... We, we, we realized that probably we didn't need to, so we came. We, we brought some dishes back. For instance, you know, instead of having you know eight components in a dish, we went down to five, and you know, instead of having three purees, we got one, or you know, all these kind of things that we kind of brought back a little bit, did a little bit more rustic because it was always pillow of fresh water, you know, um, with the Sardinian influence, um, you know, a little bit more, uh, of, you know, coming back to that. But the community supported us so much. Like I said, you know, we were so lucky that we are in fresh water. And like I said, it's a suburban restaurant. Um, that has been, you know, like really amazing. And then, so when we came back, when we started coming back, you remember how they let us do, you know, that we did 10 covers to start with. And that was, you know, so we said, okay, well, let's, that's the other thing that we, we, we got out of this, you know, that, we came up with a, what we called an exclusive menu for those 10 people because, you know, it was only 10. And we said, well, let's, have, let's give people a great experience. We guaranteed for the first time in 15 years a window table to everyone because it was only 10 people. <laughs> so we could have everyone on the veranda. So we said, okay, guaranteed window table, um, seven course exclusive menu with premium Sardinia wines. You know, this is like buy a ticket and then it went – nuts like we could not keep up with it we were fully booked for those 10 like days in advance you know and um so we kept now that on um we, we're doing that on saturdays um only exclusive on saturday because we we think you know the saturday it's a special day and you know um you know like it's the first day of the weekend and people can have you know a great lunch or a dinner so we you know still we're doing that now and it's been so so popular so you know good things came out came out of this you know and that was one of them you know that, that we wanted to give people you know an amazing experience with this exclusive um menu and it's been going you know amazingly well so yeah i mean um it, it's uh, there is a saying in italian Non tutti mali vengono per nuocere. Not all bad things come to hurt you, you know, and um, I believe in that, you know. A little earlier you mentioned how Sardinia was protected somewhat from the virus because it is an island. You know, we understand Italian cuisine, but it, it's different all over uh, Italy and uh, the cuisine is quite different um, from the north to the south. And But could you tell us a bit about Sardinian cuisine and what makes that stand out? It is an island, so, you know, and, and you said it right, you know, that, that if you were to break down Italian food, let's say into four parts to make it easy, because if you start getting deep into regional cooking and, you know, and all that kind of stuff, you never end, you know, but if you say, okay, let's call, you know, it's massive, 20 regions. So if we say the food from Italy, you know, let's break it down from the north to the center, the south and the islands. You know, that is so much diversity. But the island, it's more diverse because, you know, the islands were always invited by so many different cultures that all through the island, the food changes a lot. And Sardinia, it's one of them, you know. And I, I think I have been to Sicily and, and, and it is very diverse from, you know, the rest of Italy. But Sardinia, I think it's more because it's quite far from the mainland. It's about 350 k's off. So it's almost like, 
you know, a mini country on its own, you know, because it was invaded by, you know, the Spanish and the Catalans in the north and, you know, the, the, the more of the Arabic influence in the south because it's so close to North Africa. Um, and then, you know, the Sardinians then escaped from the coast, being so dangerous and lived in the middle of the island. So, you know, uh, developed this diet that is so different from what people really think that, you know, um, the real, you know, food of Sardinia, it's more seafood where it was, in fact, more meat and bread and, you know, and, and because when you live up on the hills and in the mountains, the coast is dangerous. So no one went, you know, to the coast fishing and the seafood came about, you know, which like it sounds like a long time ago, a hundred years, but really it's not, you know, in the scheme of where all Sardinia and, and Italy is. So the food is so, uh, you know, interesting and, you know, uh, like I said, the north part of the island, the coastline, now obviously there is quite a lot of seafood out there. Um, you know, the fish markets are amazing, but still, you know, the strong, um, you know, um, influence um, of, you know, meat, uh, like, you know, suckling pig and, you know, the dish like baby lamb and, you know, goat, um, great breads, you know, lots of bread, like um, a bread is, you know, because we, we do have, uh, you know, an Arabic background, you know, if you go to any house where, you know, like a Lebanese house i reckon you find bread on the table as soon as you walk in the door because it's such a culture you know and that's what we do it like if i go home now to sardinia there'll be bread on the table right now because it's a sign of welcoming and also it's something that you always keep on the table um you know cheese i always say that pecorino cheese is you know the second best cheese in italy because i think parmigiano reggiano is got you know the crown on top but you know pecorino i think is um it's pretty amazing and you know and sardinia is producing some incredible cheese so yeah look the the, the the you know lots of vegetables as well you know for instance my parents now you know that one of the highlight of um the year from my father is planting his little vegetable garden which he planted you know um in may because he could, you know, go out and then, you know, he was really worried about not being able to go out and plant his vegetables, fruit and vegetables this year. And he did, as he always does. And there is so much of that, like, you know, the, the Sardinians sometimes, I think, you know, it's like a, uh, there's a time of the year where they grow so much vegetables and fruit, you know, spring, summer, that they become nearly vegetarians. Like my parents live from the garden nearly for three or four months and then you know even the other day my father said oh you know we had all those tomatoes coming together i gave them to everyone all the neighbors but then we had so many more so i crushed them and put them in the freezer and then you know all the beans now they came and there is a ton of eggplants we preserved so they and they and they make the most of it they really eat a lot of veggies as well so you know that's another big part of our diet that maybe people don't know about you know where um that's also, you know, it's quite big. But, yeah, look, uh, it's very broad within the island. You know, things like recipes and dishes change from village to village. Like, you know, I remember going to um, back to the, um, the, the, you know, the area of like the north part of the island. It's called Galura. That's where they grow, you know, Vermentino um, wine and you know it's one of the best white wines around and all that but this, there is this particular dish called um zuppa galurese which is you know galurese soup which is made from uh, lamb stock that you know you soak uh, style bread because you know bread you never throw it away so you got to find a way of using it and soaking it and, and you know in, in, in stock brings it back and then you put cheese and, and fresh mint through it and becomes this savory you know baked bread soup and i remember um going to this winery and you know i got to cook this dish and i was in the heart of galura so you know i was under pressure because i had to create the right dish and i made it and i thought i was so proud you know it came out really well it was really crusty and you know i, I gave some to um uh, some of the locals you know to try because you know my aunties i thought they made really good super galurese so I, I i used my auntie's recipe and um this lady i remember she got really upset with me because she goes how dare you make this recipe and you know it, it's it's not the right one and it's all wrong and you know like what do you where do you come from you know like you know from this area how could you do something like that and i said well 
I said, I thought, you know, I, I, could, I could make a, uh, you know, a good zuppa galorese. And she goes, no, 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 no. You didn't put any tomato in. The stock is bland. You know, it needs this and it's that, more herbs. And so, you know, from area to area, the same dish, you know, like it's so different. And that's only like one example. There is hundreds of examples that I can come up with. But yeah, the food of Sardina is super interesting and very diverse, like, you know. Um, a bit like the all of Italy, if you break it down, you know, the north part of the island, the center, the coastline and the south, you know, the food changes incredibly. And the bread, the bread is massive in Sardinia, you know, and the wines now, there is so many great wines, like, you know, there is so much um, to eat and, and, you know, discover, really. One of your great loves is Bottaga, and I know you used to go back uh, to Italy to buy Bottaga to bring back here in Australia, but you ended up producing it yourself and you have your own brand out there. What's the story behind that? Yeah, that was, um, that was quite a funny story actually. Um, uh, you know, I think I've said it now a lot of times, but maybe not everyone knows. So when, when, you know, we started bringing Botarga in, but this is like back, you know, when Cala Luna days, when we opened up the first restaurant in the like mid nineties and, um, Botarga was very undiscovered in Australia and only maybe some of the Italians knew about it or the Greeks, you know, because um, also the Greeks um, eat Botarga. But I remember putting this, you know, this amazing ingredient on the menu and people had no idea what it was, you know. So I used to import it. Actually, my mom used to send it to me, in, like, you know, I remember packets of a couple of kilos and I always, you know, said, oh, you know, this is our Botarga and explain to people what it was and, you know, teaching them like what it is and how it's made and you know the mullet in Sardinia is you know from this area you know cabras and you know there is no better botarga in the world and you know the best one is definitely the Sardinia one so until one years later <clears throat> I went for a um I was I went around the island um, with a small group of Australians for a cooking tour and I was going through I took him to the biggest fish market in the island in Cagliari, which is called San Benedetto, which is an incredible fish market, you know. And they, Batarga, it's one of the ingredients that you see all around the markets because it comes from, you know, the, the south of the island. And they call it, you know, the gold of Sardinia. So I was just, you know, showing off saying, you know, look at this. This is the Sardinian Botarga, everyone. It's amazing. Look at that one and that one. And this guy, <laughs> Stefan, his name was, he goes, oh, are you, are you guys Australians? He called up, you know. I said, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're Australians. And oh, I picked up your accent. You know, I love Australia. You know, I go every year. I said, wow, every year? Uh, what, do you, what do you do there? Like, I said, oh, do you go on holidays? Or, oh, no, no, I go to Queensland because I go there and buy Malleroy <laughs> to make Botarga. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what? And everybody's going, hang on a second. Is this Sardinia stuff or is this Aussie stuff? <laughs> so then he came over and he said, oh, you know, guys, look, you know, if anyone in Sardinia now, especially the bigger producers, you know, like Stefano Rocca, all these guys that they produce a lot of Botarga, they say to you that the Sardinian role, it's enough to supply, first of all, the, the, you know, the demand that Sardinia has, especially in summer with the tourism and that, but also the export market, which is really, really big. If they say to you that it's enough, just, you know, to have like the, the, the Sardinian uh, role, it's not true. It's not true at all. Like we run out every year. There is never enough. So we started, you know, to, to, to keep up with demand. We started importing roll and doing it, you know, in the Sardinian way where, you know, the salt is to be salty and yes, to have lots of minerals, the preserving of that, that's important, you know, the way that you dry it and all that. But we find that the best, quality raw apart from the Sardinia one is the Australian one and that's when I said well then what's the point why don't I just make my own so I, I went to see the guys that you know this Stefano was buying the raw from in, in Queensland uh, Markwell Fisheries um, Ruben which is a great guy and I ended up going fishing with them for mullet and you know now we, we uh, produce our botarga uh, together with uh, Costa because um, you know Costa has been a friend of mine for so many years and he understands the product and, you know, we got the dry room like down pet uh, with him and, you know, we do it together. But the other, you know, great thing that, that uh, we got now is that um, Alex Olsen created, because the salt is such an important part. There is not much to it. There is the roll 
and then the salt and then the way that you you know you dry it and how long for and all that which you know we, we do that but then the salt that we we you know we um, cover the botarga with for a couple of hours to preserve it needs to be like I said quite salty quite sticky a little bit moist it needs to have lots of minerals and when I say to Alex look I'm looking for a salt to make botarga like what can you do and she said leave it with me we'll come up with something you know and I explained to her the other Sardinian salt and she uh, you know obviously she's so amazing she made uh, I remember she made a um, bunch of samples um, the, the, you know how coarse the salt was it needs to be fine because it sticks better and she came up with the salt mix now that you know we make botarga with it and, and, I, and I, I'm telling you it's like the Sardinian stuff so you know here we are now we have a great Australian product made with Australian roe Australian salt and it's you know it, it's as good as if not better of the Sardinian some of the Sardinian stuff out there so you know it's it's been an incredible journey this I tell you Absolutely amazing! What a what a crazy story! Yeah, yeah, I know it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. How are you feeling at the moment? You know, with the restaurant, you've had Pillow for quite a while now, and it's a pretty weird climate out there. And Melbourne's in lockdown. Is how are you feeling about the next couple of months and year? Look, I can't say, um, Anthony. Look, if I I think it's fair to say that you know it hasn't been a walk in the park, right? It's been like I said, very challenging and. Only thanks to, you know, an amazing team that we have. And we've been around for like, you know, 16 years in the same restaurant. So you become quite resilient. You know your business well. And you know when you got to react and push. And, you know, we've been through hard times and good times. So we've been through like times, you know, up and downs. And then, you know, um, we, look, it, it's not – sometimes I wake up and go, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> like, you know, and then, you know, I, I clear my mind and, you know, I'm lucky that, you know, I exercise quite a lot, you know, so my mind is always quite sharp and, you know, that, that helps me a lot. Um, and, and I just go, look, you just got to keep going and keep pushing and, you know, we, we, we're in the mix with everyone else. I feel a, a, a lot, I'm just saying this, I feel for the guys in Melbourne because I know what we went through you know, when we first had to um, close down or, you know, or do the tuck away and, and change all that. And, and they went through the same thing. And then you reopen and things are starting to come back and, you know, and then you have to close again. So I couldn't even think about, we are thinking about it. It's in the back of our mind. We talk about, you know, if there is another shutdown, guys, we need to be prepared this time. But to go through that again, it must be really tough for them. Like it's a... It must be incredibly hard. So, um, but you know, we're pushing through, and and you know, like I said, we are super lucky that you know we we're not you know in the city. We are in like in a great suburb, and you know that they, they are loyal customers, and and you know the, the the clientele that we have, you know, it's been so supportive, and people have been, you know, why I think people have been a little bit more understanding as well. In, because you know the situation is not the same. You know we do restricted numbers, and sometimes we can't fit any everyone in, and we have to change things sometimes and all that. But people have been very, very good. Like you know, it's been it's been amazing. And, and you know, our suppliers that you know we've been, we've known each other for so many years. Um, you know, we we we're getting through this together, which is you know it's not easy, but hey, we just got to do what we got to do. You know? I know you've got a truffle dinner on. What's it been like putting that together, a truffle dinner during a pandemic? <laughs> so much fun. Like we, we've had, we did one, so we wanted to do a truffle dinner last week um, because, you know, truffles are such an Australian product now and, you know, it's a great produce and Australia produces amazing truffles and, you know, it's like any seasonal ingredient. you got to make the most of it when it's around because, you know, in about three months, won't be around anymore so you know to support the farmers again we need to use truffles and eat them right now because they'll be gone uh soon so we said you know why don't we do a dinner so you know let's do a weeknight and we put up you know a great dinner great dishes and so last week we did the first one and sold out <laughs> literally like a rock concert <laughs> you know in 24 hours was sold out it went crazy and Marilyn and i are going you know and, and some of the guys and our chef Federico saying 
guys, what do we do? Like, we've got all these customers that want to come, but we can't fit them in because we can only do, like, 55 covers. Um, and we said, well, let's do another one. So we're doing a pasta one tonight. Um, and as you know, you know, pasta and truffles, I mean, mm. you know. Amazing. It goes extremely well. Yeah, so, you know, five courses, all pastas, um, using, you know, um, duck and in one and rabbit in the other and, you know. Uh, we're using fregola as well, which is another great, you know, Sardinian ingredient. But you know, just doing a simply to start with. Um, but yeah, it's going to be it's going to be exciting. And we're using truffles. I mean, look, truffles. There's so many good farmers out there. But you know, as you know, Tasmania probably being one of the first ones that they planted truffles. Um, you know, back in 2001 or whatever there was. You know, the farm, as you know, you know, the older it gets, the better the truffles get. So you know, we got some amazing stuff out there, and it's been. From a business point of view, to be honest, it's been really good for us because, uh, to be honest, the prices dropped a little bit, so um, they're a little bit more affordable. Because I don't think you know a lot of stuff um, is going overseas. I think you know a lot of stuff is staying in Australia, so I think the price it's a little bit more affordable. That means that we can pass it on, obviously, a lot cheaper, and, and you know make the most of it, which is such a great, um, like I say, such a great product. So you know we need to just use more and more of it. Yeah. Oh, mate, I know we need to let you get back into the kitchen because you've got a really big night tonight, but we're so um, honoured to have you chat with us today on the show. Um, keep in touch and um, let us know how you go with a truffle dinner and if there's any more, actually. Um, they sound amazing. Um, and we'll talk soon. Maybe you should come up. You should come up. I would love to. Come up and um, <laughs> we have some truffles um, one day. Just come up and we sit for a bowl of pasta or something like that, but... It's been great um, for you to have me, mate, because, you know, speaking up about what we're going through and giving me the opportunity of, you know, telling people about, what, you know, what's happening out there, it's important. So uh, thank you so much, mate. Thanks, mate. You're a legend. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's hospo community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>